You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Proud to welcome you all here. Glad to see very familiar faces, and I'm glad to see some new faces. I'm also honored to introduce our moderator for this evening. Catherine Clay is Vice President, Global Head of Information Services at SIBO Global Markets, oversees three business lines index services, enhanced market data and analytics, and execution services. She came to Cebu through the 2015 acquisition of the San Francisco fintech company LiveAll, where she was CEO. Prior to LiveAll, Catherine was a market maker in equity and index options on the NYSA ARCA floor, 1994 to 2010, starting her career with Timber Hill before co-founding her own proprietary trading company. The format for this evening will be that Catherine will introduce our panelists and moderate the group as they discuss finding an edge, how option traders use alternative data sets. Please hold your questions until after the discussion as we will then have time for Q&A. I will be roaming about with the microphone so we all can hear your good questions. Finally, Catherine has asked that each panelist provide a whimsical detail uh -oh. about themselves. Uh-oh. For herself, she offered up that her first real job was as a Zamboni driver at the University of Colorado. She keeps her ice-making skills fresh as a backup career hedge. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Catherine Clay. Catherine? Thank you, Michael. I first want to thank uh, very much Kat and Jenny for organizing uh, this great event. They spent a lot of hours putting this together, uh, keeping all of us uh, organized and uh, ready to put on a nice panel here. And we do have a great panel. I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled uh, with who we have up on the stage uh, tonight. I'm gonna start with uh, Barry. Many of you know Barry Starr. Barry is the CEO of Wall Street Horizons, which he founded in 2003. And today he's leading the company through a really rapid uh, growth uh, progression. Uh, very highly known for their event data, the data that we recently added to the SIBO uh, data shop and excited to partner with uh, Barry on that. He's formerly an executive at Fidelity. Uh, Barry developed the highly successful Fidelity Investor Advisor Group, uh, which provides brokerage services to independent money managers, Fidelity Online Express, and the first PC-based brokerage trading and accounting system. Uh, about Barry, Barry was fortunate to be a witness to the birth of the personal computer industry. He doesn't look that old. <laughs> Having worked with Steve Jobs when he was at Apple Computer the first time and even wrote and sold Apple software in little plastic baggies near the beginning of time. And just to prove that this is true, I have an image of Barry's name tag at Apple all those years ago. Wow. Still above my desk. <laughs> uh, next, uh, third actually, Henry Schwartz. Uh, Henry started out as a runner on SIBO nearly 30 years ago and made markets on U.S. and European option exchanges before moving on to institutional desks in New York. After five years at Bank of America, Henry joined forces with a derivatives technologist to create Trade Alert LLC. This is his firm focused on increasing transparency in the options markets for institutional users. He takes it as a compliment that Bloomberg has attempted to copy much of his platform's functionality with little success. Before entering the world of finance, believe it or not, Henry did bird calls on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I totally did not believe this when he submitted this as his whimsical note. So we did do a fact checking on this. And in fact, if you Google bird calling on Johnny Carson, up comes a video from 1985, Piedmont High School really? student, really? Henry Schwartz doing a bird call. I think it was the Red Wing Blackbird? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's oh not cool. Are we get it? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. We Maybe, after, on the spot Maybe after the drinks. So, no, no, no. Uh, right here, Michael Ozaki. Michael is the CEO and founder of FT Options, 
Michael began his career in trading derivatives at O'Connor and Associates, and after having graduated from Penn with degrees in computer science, engineering, and finance from Wharton, he later went on to earn his MBA from the Kellogg School of Management. Michael's career has spanned 25 years with senior trading and portfolio management roles at Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, and other trading operations. It is the foundation that he brings to the table to combine uh, his engineering background in financial technology and trading to develop FT options into one of the most respected names in derivative risk, trading, and custom volatility analytic solutions. When Michael isn't busy uh, coordinating the FT options team and the platform, he can be found chasing his two kids at home or in the kitchen creating healthy ketogenic meals. Now, why is this important? The man you're seeing here today is a much smaller man <laughs> in a certain form than he was a year ago. You probably saw this headshot in the program, but I want to show you a different headshot before about a year ago. Before the keto diet, this is Mike. Jackie Gleason. <laughs> he has wow. lost 77 pounds following this healthy regime. Wow. Amazing and speaks to the great discipline, which by the way shows up in his technology for sure. All the way from Germany, we are really privileged to have Robin Mess with us, CEO, co-founder of Big XYT, which is an independent provider of smart data and analytic solutions to the global trading and investment community. Robin's prior roles include executive positions at consulting and software companies, enabling clients to process and normalize large data sets on demand and in real time in order to innovate faster, to comply with regulatory requirements, and reduce the complexity of their operations. Robin earned an M a master's in mathematics from Kit. Um, he, Robin is an outdoor enthusiast. The first time I had dinner with Robin, he told me a story about um, his outdoor endeavors, where he and his wife took, at that, at that time, their one-year-old and two-year-old on a not planned, no logistics, no reservations, 600 kilometer bike trek. And I got evidence of that very trip right here. And this is Robin at the time with his one and two year old on this amazing bike ride. Good job. Wow. Now let's get to the topic, the topic that we're all here to really sink our teeth into, which is a really important topic. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a more refined topic from big data in general, but as traders and investors, really what do we care about? We're looking for sourcing alpha in the markets. We're, we're trying to find the next best strategy, the next innovation, the thing that can give us an edge in our investment outcomes. It's not an easy thing to do when you think of the deluge of information and data that we are um, struck with on a daily basis. And that day, the data, which is coming in a lot of digital forms, is really kind of put into this new category called alt data. And that's what we're gonna focus on tonight is really looking at how alt data uh, can be found, sourced, and used for options traders and futures traders. So I want to start with one of the, the biggest obstacles of even thinking about getting into using data. And one of that is just finding the data. You know, Barry, you work with clients all the time to try to help solve their problems and understand what they want to see and how they want to see it. So what are you learning from your clients about the obstacles they're facing and even finding the right data sets? Well, first of all, thank you for all coming. I grew up in Chicago, so it's glad to be back here. Afterwards, if anybody is interested, uh, I was singularly responsible for the Cubbies winning the World Series last year. I'm happy to tell you why after, after the fact. Uh, it's true, we work, with, we work with clients all the time. We have a bunch of different data sets. Some of them are utility data sets. Some of them are, is alt data. And you know, alt data, the word gets thrown around all the time. There's as much alt data as there are stars in the sky. It's tons of it. At the end of the day though, most of it is not profitable. It might be interesting, it might be, wow, that's really cool. Weather data bounced off of cell towers or you know, whatever people, uh, uh, you know, doing Google searches, but at the end of the day, it's about can I find an alt data set that I can use to make money from? Is it in a format that I can use and manipulate with? Is it trustworthy? Is it clean? Um, and 
uh, you know, you have to take all those things into account and all of them have to kind of have, you have to answer yes to all of those things to be able to actually come up with a way to use all data to make money. I might challenge what one thing you said, and I'd like to get the other panelists uh, on that, but I actually did just a little bit of research about who's using all data and the impact of using all data. And I was reading this Greenwich Associates survey that found that, in fact, 78% of hedge funds are now using some form of alt data in their algorithms or their models. And of those 78%, 90% of them are reporting that, in fact, the alt data sets they are using are having an impact. What do you think of that? Does that seem like a real statistic? Anyone? I mean, I would say it's almost like a, you know, we're mostly option people here. That's who, that's my, my network of people is. And we all kind of know that the things that worked 10, 15 years ago don't, you know, they, they've become so efficient that they've stopped working in terms of generating alpha. So there's this evolution, there's this kind of weeding out of like, okay, what else? You know, like, okay, so we, you look at option prices. Okay, I guess that's old-fashioned normal data. But, you know, you know, then you think about, okay, well, what about volatility curves, volatility, volatility surfaces and everything else? And it's like, okay, that's fine. And that's almost become very normal data now. And that's, there's nothing very alt about it because, you know, almost everybody can get their hands on it now. So um, you, you get down, you know, you, you're just kind of going down the road and saying, okay, well, you know, whether it's drone footage of parking lots or whatever the hell, you know, people keep trying stuff. And that is really what's, and the stuff that works, they stick with. And I, you know, to hear that you know, 70% of, of you know, the hedge funds are using it, you know, it's probably 100%. I mean, I can't imagine people trying to make money off of the data that worked 10 years ago and not paying attention to the things that are actually you know, kind of in, impactful now. I didn't know that we were going to uh, be using statistics here, but there was Oh, this a, is all factual, Barry. Uh, an article I read recently, somebody passed it along, that said that, you know, quant is like the number one title, job title on Wall Street these days in, in, in trading firms. But in fact, you know, was it 70 or 80 percent of a quant's job these days is doing nothing more than just cleaning up data. So it's a very important, you're shaking your head, you're in the day, you, you probably see that all the time. Um, you know, Cleanliness is just important. It's not just the data set, but it's how clean the data is to be able to actually do something with it. I, I couldn't agree more. So what we what we actually see is that quants are hired for risk management or alpha generating strategies, but then suddenly they end up cleaning data, and cleaning data is definitely a different job than um, building models that generate signals. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a certain disappointment, I think, with all these quants and data scientists uh, that they have to do a pretty boring <coughs> job before they can reach the pretty interesting stuff. Well, I mean, that brings us to, you know, the trust of the data set sounds like it's in the cleanliness, but what about the contributors to the data set? I mean, is there a trust issue with actually who is contributing data into the data set? Mike? Well, I mean, I think that for a lot of the data that we get, we get from high quality vendors, right? So I think that some of the, the sourcing that, that Barry does, you have a trust issue with people that are going out and finding an earnings date, for example. But um, for the most part, I think that we find that, to speak to the data science whole concept, um, you know what? I lost my train of thought on that one, sorry. Well, let's, just, let's, take it like, let's take an example. So social media analytics, right? They have great sentiment data. They're known for their sentiment data. And I was at a conference one time, and somebody asked the question, well, can't Twitter be manipulated? Like, if you're actually sourcing you know, proprietary scores off SMA data, for example, and now you're feeding sentiment data into a model, is there any way to manipulate data, like sentiment data or other data, that then you have to solve for on the other end because you're trying to trade off of that data. Manipulate as in use the data or manipulate as in skewing the data? Anything that takes it from its pristine form would be some sort of manipulation of the data. So let's say, Barry, you're using as a trader um, an alternative data set that's producing a signal for you that's generating alpha. Last thing you want is for a hundred other firms to figure out how to use that signal, right? Mm -hmm. So don't you think that there is some sort of I'm not going to say spoofing, but something that is possible in data sets that could actually 
degregate data, the trust of the data set itself. So we talked about clean, and we all think of cleaning data as like making data valid, but what about clean data in terms of making sure that it's actually So I would jump in on that one. That one's more in our wheelhouse, right? So what we find a lot of times is that people manipulate the prices of options, which will then affect, manipulating sometimes by going wide, which will then affect the volatility surfaces. So if you're using a volatility surface for pricing a structure or for trying to generate trade ideas, and people are going wide on certain strikes, then you can wind up with a very non-smooth volatility surface. And so we do find quite a bit of that going on, where it may not even be intentional, where people are just like, look, we're just not quoting this whole strip of strikes. And that will affect the volatility surface. And then there are techniques to try to combat that. And I wouldn't say it's data smoothing. It's probably more just trying to introduce stability into your product. Uh -huh. right? So our products have to be stable. We're not just redistributing raw data. I think that that ship sailed like 15, 20 years ago. Now we're. Yeah, I, th I think it takes a lot. The, like the kind of expertise or the product understanding that, like it, it reminds, like, you know, unfortunately options is <laughs> in my DNA at this point, but it, you think about like SPX PM versus SPX to, to pick SIBO products, but, you know, SPX quotes on the screen are a dollar or $2 wide, even though for an institutional person they're a nickel wide on the phone, la la la. But when SPX PM showed up, and all of a sudden you had screen tradable products, you realize that you know, for, for quarter, the only difference was AM, PM, right? You're like, well, wait a second. How come the midpoints aren't the same? There's almost no difference here. And you, you realize you know, not, not, manipula not manipulation or even misleading of data, but you, you know, if you knew what you were looking at, you could say, like, wait a second. OK, SPX is $1.50 wide, so there's plenty of room. If the, if the pit doesn't want to buy any more options, they're going to lower themselves down. And the midpoint is not, doesn't represent the value, right? They just don't want to own any at the moment. And so you could do some, some you know, intelligent lifting and say, well, you know what? There's some very juicy data here, which you know, now maybe you, you smooth it or you average it or whatever. But you know, so I think that in terms of the, the, the provider of this alternative data, there is so much data out there nowadays that you can get all the data you want, but it's you know it's garbage if you don't have somebody in the kind of originating it or at least organizing it that is going to do some things like you know like you're saying like you know what a crappy point in a vol fitting you know algo needs to be understood. Oh, there's going to be crappy points, and we're not going to let those you know work into the modeling that we're doing. So I think it matters a lot. It's very interesting to see uh, how long we can discuss around something so simple, at least to the industry, like volatility surfaces. And there we already spot quality issues and trust issues. And if we take into account alternative data, uh, the issue explodes immediately because we have uh, additional data sources, we have normalization issues uh, in order to, to generate statistics. So um, I think the trust issue is a very big one because you always, even though you're consuming normalized or derived data, you need to understand where the underlying data came from. So really every single step, even though it's very convenient to consume it at the end through a normalized way, every single step uh, and understand the impact on the data point that you're then using for your trading or signal. So I'm going to stick with you, Robin, and sort of segue um, from, let's assume we can find that clean, trustable data set that we're ingesting in our models and using in our algorithms. Well, now the next obstacle becomes, well, how do we actually bring that into our workflow seamlessly such that it's, it's not a disruptor, it's actually additive, and we're able to consume it in a way that's really meaningful. So we've, we've, we've tackled the first obstacle, we've got our clean data set, and now we have to like start to ingest it. And how? What do your clients tell you about how they want to ingest this data? Everyone in a slightly different way. But uh, <laughs> I mean, we already touched it uh, with the first topic. Um, the the data per se is well useless. We have to transform it to something valuable, and that requires heavy processing, heavy processing in terms of aligning multiple data sets, normalization, quality assurance, etc. So. That requires technology, that requires uh, experts that understand the data, that understand the purpose, where to use it, in which model, etc. So uh, the ingredients are, it's not only data or in multiple data sources. It's infrastructure, it's uh, software layers, 
its processes, its optimization, maintenance people, etc. So uh, what we see is that even though there are traditional models on how to consume data, for example, through file transfer, people are asking more and more for a more convenient access to data. So more convenient like APIs that they want to rely on convenient access without losing the transparency where the individual data points were derived from. And uh, we believe from conversations that we have with clients, not only in the options business, but across asset classes, that the demand will accelerate over the next years because it's just a building block, a building block that reduces the complexity. Um, the important thing is that the building block does not uh, offer a black box where the details are hidden. The important thing is that we offer the transparency of a single step of processing and deriving the valuable data sets. And uh, we touched the, the topic of quants and data scientists. Data scientists today, um, it's very challenging to, to hire data scientists as quants. Uh, so we see that clients are, uh, are hiring talented people directly from university and look for tools how to accelerate their development. And exposing them to data, that means that they are spending 80% of their time cleaning data, aligning data, until they are able to find actionable content. So uh, we believe that it will be central for, not only for the options community, options trading community, but uh, across the industry, to accelerate the growth of talent using tools and, and web-based services. I would, I would agree with that. Sorry, Barry. We, we see a lot of requests for for REST APIs, and um, almost everyone's coding them with Python. So for the most part, um, that's probably been our biggest request. I would say several years ago, people wanted direct SQL access to a database. I think you guys had a product like that. And um, it just turns out that Python and consuming a REST API has just become a very natural fit. We, um, we deliver a lot of our content that way, and it's, it's, uh, it's Everyone, when you say REST API and you can consume it in Python, it's like the conversation is basically over. They, they've got it. Um, but we don't do any real time through that. So that's a whole different section. Um, so I agree. And everyone wants their own little twist on the API. So that's where it gets tricky. I would like to add one comment, uh, also from experience with our clients. It's, it's actually not only about moving technology into the cloud. So uh, everyone is aware of AWS, Google Cloud, and, uh, and these other innovations. But to, uh, based on our experience, it doesn't solve the issue. It's still technology. It's just in a different place. It, it sorts scalability stuff. Uh, so it solves scalability of infrastructure. But um, the detail that is required in capital markets to understand condition codes, as an example, or to understand outliers in volatility services, that's the attention of detail that is required. And that will require specific tools for, individual, for an individual audience or for a specific audience, like options market making or options trading in general. So there is enough room to leverage these kind of uh, technical innovations and offer value-added services based on alternative data sets, normalization, combining hundreds of data sets in a service, and then making the life easier of these quants and data scientists. Henry, what's your experience with your platform? I mean, you're, you're definitely delivering really trading signals with your, your alerts. And I remember when you first came out with the platform, um, you know, people were consuming it directly from the platform, but it's, it's migrated, right? It's, it has, a lot of people are connecting differently. And what are you seeing in terms of, of how people want to consume your data? Right, well, every, every year for the last five years, we've, we've said this is the year of the feed. This is the year that the terminal business kind of shrinks and that feed business picks up. And it, it, it's been slower than, like, I would have thought. You know, the, the, the individuals in the business, you know, who are, you know, we love to serve are still out there. Um, we're seeing more and more feeds. We're seeing more, um, you know, the, the RESTful API is kind of the way. Even, even shops that probably should take a, like a local library for real-time data, you know, like, like Goldman, for example, you know, they can do anything they want, except that for security issues, a RESTful API is what they, is the only thing they can really do kind of on the desk level. So um, 
that is the way that people want everything. And even though I, I kind of agree with what you're saying, is, is you know, if you're if you've got a, a you know a quant trying to pull in a whole bunch of different data sets, I think standardization is really their fantasy. But um, you know the, the the RESTful API you know methodology is relatively you know they, they they have to write the code, but they can get everything they want. So um, it is a bigger and bigger part of things. Just you know, and and on the option side, I mean, it's you know the, the um, individual trader doing things you know by eye, you know, click trading is is going away, you know? I mean, I kind of hope it doesn't go away for a long, long time, but it's a, it's a smaller and smaller piece of the business. Um, and, you know, with, 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 you know, the business has shifted. Big, you know, market makers now, there's only three or four that are doing, you know, 75% of the volume. Um, those guys have the scale. Those guys have the you know, $50 million a year tech budget. Um, and so everybody else who, uh, you know, wants to be involved in this business is, is basically looking for different approaches and trying different things and coming up with their own um, special sauce. And, you know, and that really is where the alt data um, comes in because that's, that's kind of the only way you're really going to compete with. You know, Citadel's budget. But how do you wade in the, the waters of alt data and not take a bath on the expenses that, that you might incur just trying to get to a good data set? I mean, Barry, what do you what do you think of people they think I need your event data because it's going to really separate, you know, my trading. And and they come to you and they they, they want to buy it. I mean, how do you assure them that this is actually going to have a positive alpha return for them? Well, the answer to the prior question is that through trial, we've been doing this for 15 years, through trial and error and error and error and error and error, we actually deliver data to the Chicago community every which way. It started in email, then it went to web, then we had a bunch of traders show up and say, start with here's, Max? here's, actually, uh, hmm, maybe. Um, we had uh, actually some Chicago traders um, come to us and say, here's my needle, I want machine readable data, stick it right in the vein, forget all the web stuff. Then so we went to FTP, then they said uh, they, uh, there were people that weren't technical enough, so then we wrote a GUI, so we have a GUI going, then they said, that's really awesome, can you give me an API version of that? And so we have an API version of it, and then uh, for the low latency stuff, we have sockets. So we actually deliver on all these different channels, and for all the clients, uh, you know, folks that we work with here in this room, we probably deliver some data through all those different things because we have to be ready for however people want to consume it. In terms of trying it, uh, you know, our, al our alternative, we're in the calendar business, our, our alternative data is not when something's going to happen, but when is that something changing and moving around on the calendar, which is kind of an interesting thought. And there's a lot of alpha, but uh, in that, it's been proven, there's academic research and all that stuff, but uh, to answer your question, people stick their toe into it in different types of ways. Some people want to see it once a day while they play with it. Some people uh, do it on a pull basis, and then when they kind of understand it and get comfortable with it, they might move to the push basis where it's done on a more real-time basis. And so it's what we've discovered, again, trial, error, 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 and just being responsive to clients is we deliver any way they ask. So I want to get to, you know, maybe the most common question that's asked about alternative data, which is really the point about the shelf life of the data. You know, it's, it's valuable until everybody else discovers it, and then it's not valuable. And so, you know, everybody starts looking for the next best thing, and then that's great until it, it's, it's discovered. And so I want to just ask the panelists, what is the shelf life of alternative data in general? Like, how, how long can you have an advantage with it overall? And I understand different data sets are different, but I want to hear your thoughts about the shelf life of alternative data. Um, why don't we start with uh, Mike on this one? I think depends is obviously an easy answer there on, on that one. Um, we found that the shelf life is, for the events based up, is because you've only got four events per, per year, it's actually been pretty long. Because you don't have, you know, companies change, so I, I, we consume, you know, there's some business relationships up here, so we consume some of the. Uh, Wall Street Horizons data. For the earnings data, we had found that companies change so much over a period of time that you know, looking at Amazon earnings from three or four years ago, it's, it's a different world. So you know, the shelf life on earnings data we found has been quite good, especially with predicting what vols are going to do or what the moves are going to be. I think that 
You know, one of the things that we also look at is like, what is alternative data, right? I mean, we've got some clients who are not even trading options that are consuming volatility surfaces and implied earnings moves and realized moves because they're trying to stick them into the machine and try to find if there's any edge just trading the underliers. So, and also alternative data from our perspective includes the customer's investment thesis, their model, their positions, right? So we look at it, you know, we've historically called it analytics, much less than alt data. I mean, alt data is a, a new term and I think of it more as somebody, every different customer is looking at it, they've got a position, they've got a model, they've got a trading strategy, they're consuming multiple data sources. That whole package to us consists of a data set. You know, and that's where we think that that's, it's got a long runway as far as you know, are people successful, they have good track records. We don't feel like, you know, we, we think also people are constantly reformulating their model. So we get people that say, you know, selling ball right after the earnings announcement, that's just, that trade doesn't work anymore. So they just don't bother with that. They jump onto trying to, people are trying to look at crypto and trying to see if crypto can inform the movement in any particular stock. And so there's just a lot of, customers are innovative. And I would say the biggest thing that we tend to do is we, we tend to follow what our customers want to do. So customers say, hey, do you guys have any data for same source sales? And all of a sudden, this question start to tick in, and we start to realize that that's what they were looking to do. And then we'll call Barry or you know, whoever else and try to get at it. Well, Robin, you, you being a European voice, I mean, do you see anything different in Europe than maybe we see here that you would identify, or what are the highest demand sort of alt data sets that you would? No, not really. I mean, uh, the alternative data sets that are ingested, they they usually work globally. So uh, whether it's any forecasting of events or whether it's really alternative data like social media uh, indicators or signals. Um, it's applied globally, uh, but in order to answer your question, I think um, we have to realize one thing. Uh, there might be value in a data set where the transition to an actionable signal is pretty obvious, but then data itself uh, sometimes is not, well, does not offer the signal in an obvious way, so it has to be transformed. And this transformation uh, offers so many ways that it can actually survive as a valuable data source for a significant period of time. Because there will be always be angles where a trader or a market maker will use it as a slightly different uh, way, combining it with an additional new data source. And that will add value in that specific moment and last for some time. And then they might add another angle. So. Uh, it's an ongoing story, and I think that's, uh, that's the experience of ev everyone in the room, that uh, it's, it's a continuous adaptation and questioning the existing setup, the existing system, the existing data sources. But doesn't it feel somewhat like an arms race? You know, Doesn't it feel uncomfortable if you're not like on the forefront of finding these new data sets and thinking about using them? At it's a brains race. It, it, exactly. you know, you, you, the money doesn't always get you there. If you've got an army of people that can go out there and mine data, you need to know where to look as well. And so that's why you know, everyone up here, like we're all focusing on different things. But for the most part, we're out there trying to find something which will you know, generate interest amongst the customers. Right. And Henry, I mean, that's your, your business, right? You're generating signals and alerts that are designed to help, help your clients achieve some alpha from that some insight, some information that makes a difference in their investing returns. Yeah, and, and I would say that, that you know, like what Robin was saying that, I mean, you know, we've, we've put out, you know, 10 years ago we came up with, you know, unusual volume alerts because I knew at B of A, it, customers would ask about it and if we didn't know about it, we look stupid. So, <laughs> um, but what's funny is, is it, it, it does stick. Like, you know, we're still in the same stuff. We've added on, you know, <laughs> My wife is like, you've been at this for like 12 years. Isn't it finished yet? And I'm like, no, it's not finished. It's not like you take like a, you know, you take a break for a month and it's, you know, it, it fades. So you know, the alt data, I think, you know, if an unusual volume alert or the aggregation of a big aggressive sweep order was alt data, um, it, it gets layered on top of like you can't not really know that stuff that doesn't it doesn't like it's it, to me it's not like you try it and say okay this, there's nothing there 
move on to the next. I mean, maybe a few things people give up on, but I mean, we've seen over you know a decade, um, you know, people getting more methodical about earnings gap analysis. Like that's become just a thing now, and like you see it everywhere. Yeah, you know what Amazon is implying a you know a seven percent move, and the eight quarter median is you know six point three percent, and you know, and the you know third quarter is usually a little different in this way. You know, and that becomes a mandatory way of looking at things, and then you have to, but, but you're not done, because that might work for a, you know, a cycle or two, and then you know, other people are integrating the same information. You can't kind of ignore it, but you better figure out a way to find the next edge or to, to kind of preserve it, because you know, I think everybody you know, in here knows you know, it, it's, not, it's not the olden days where you were kind of in a structural spot to make money. You know, I mean, again, I'm coming from the options side. Market makers used to pretty much pay your fee to get down on the floor, and you were a needed part of the process, and you were compensated for that. And you had plenty of, you know, dopes that would just say, whatever he said, I'm on that quote. <laughs> and, you know, the Me Too guys, um, I won't insult Timber Hill. I was just going to say it. I, I won't. I didn't. I didn't even you say it, resist. but you were thinking it. You <laughs> Well, it's a, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's not there anymore. There, nobody need. You know, th this market has been pretty much disintermediated. There is no structural need for uh, somebody to stand in the middle. So, you know, it, it's it, it. You know, we can say, oh, it was so easy back then. It really wasn't that easy then either. But it's it's you can't. You, you're not. You know, it, the money's not going to come to you. Yeah. You know, I think everybody in here knows. You got to work hard to figure out something that nobody else is quite figuring out, and um, and that you know this alt data it, it's 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 not a, it's not it's not really alt. It's just it's it's what you have to be doing on top of kind of the basics of of you know of whatever you're trading to survive. So I'd like to offer a, a um, point of relief to those in the audience. Uh, our biggest seller is, uh, in terms of alt data, is earnings date revisions, when earnings dates change. And Deltix last year did a study that showed, we've been selling this data set for 12 years, 13 years, something like that, and Deltix showed that <laughs> strategy still works today. It's, you know, it, it, it's long going, there are plenty of strategies out there that continue to work quarter by quarter to quarter. This particular one, Mike Green's over there, you can go ask him, is really simple. If a company moves their date forward, buy it, essentially. And if the company moves the date back, delays the date, sell it. This is so, where I jump in and say, <laughs> this is a disclaimer about investment <laughs> advice. <laughs> sim sim simple stuff. But the point, the point is, the point is, was the Delta study was, the point is that here's, a, here's an alt data strategy that's been working for 13 years. It's not an in and out, you know, <clears throat> transitional, you know, transitory kind of thing. It's something that goes on and on. And there are lots of sets like that. A lot of sets like that. Yeah, those are the ones you, you want, the gift that keeps giving, right? Works for us. I think we have the time for one more topic. And I want to, uh, Mike, you brought up the word crypto. And I think we can't have a panel these days without bringing up that, uh, yes. that, that, that word. So we're going we're gonna to go there. And uh, I'm going to go to Henry on this. But um, you know, as we've seen participants in the market really start moving from options and futures into the crypto asset space. I mean, I was in the elevator in, in, in our building and the traders were, you know, coming down from work and they're all kind of hyped up. And I said, are you guys trading Bitcoin? And they're like, well, of course we're trading Bitcoin, you know. And so I think it is really prevalent. But when you think about, you know, what are the differences in data consumption, data needs that crypto traders require that maybe options and futures trader didn't. I mean, it, it, just to give an example, if you're, if you're trading options and futures, you're talking about equities, and you can get to the value of an equity by a discounted cash flow model or something of that nature. But when you're talking about what is the valuation of a crypto asset, well, now you're more into like a GDP calculation, like MB equals PQ calculation. So when you're trying to give crypto traders an advantage, and what are you thinking about these days, Henry? I mean, we actually, <clears throat> you know, you can't quite fight the tide. So we're like, well, we have a delivery mechanism. We know lots of smart people. You know, there's crypto data. What's interesting on the data side is, is 
you know, we're, we're coming from the exchange data side, data's expensive and it's tightly controlled and like, you know, not to pick a fight with, with you know, the data people, but, you know, for us to serve you real-time NYSC spot data is $50 a month. And it doesn't matter if you're getting it on three other systems and it's really kind of inefficient and, and expensive for what it is. And um, crypto is, a, is a, the wild west. It's ba the data is basically all free and it's coming from global and it's coming 24 hours a day. And we're like, well, let's see what we can kind of cobble together here. And it, it is a very exciting space and it makes you think really differently. And I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but even the concept of well, how much is Bitcoin up today? Like, well, there's no close. There's no open close. <laughs> so you end up saying, well, I guess everybody's going to go off of this 24-hour change thing, which is kind of what people use. But that's, that's a, that, takes, like, that can give you a headache because you look at it, one, the same price, one hour to the next is not the same 24-hour change. And so you really do have to, to, to look at it through a different lens. So, I mean, we've started pulling in data and try, basically trying to talk to um, customers, users, and say what, what really would be helpful here um, in the crypto space. And to see it, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't know if it's going to be, if, if in two years we'll laugh about all the money that was lost, made and lost, or, or we'll cry because we didn't put our life savings into it. But, you know, it, there's a, there is a ton of activity. And, you know, option guys know, you know, it's all about arbitrage and, you know, buying cheap and selling expensive. And, Fragmentation, you know that that all exists in the crypto space. So, you know what we see is a lot of interesting and, uh, and you know and and valuable projects in um, some of the some similar stuff to the option space, right? Obviously, you have 15 options exchanges, and you have you know the Apple you know June 150 calls are trading everywhere. Crypto, you have the same kind of thing, but you get different countries and different exchanges and different translations you have to do to kind of equalize things. So, um, on the data side, there's a lot of opportunity to help people understand what's going on. And that's really, that is the core of what we've always done, which is like, this is a complicated market, but you're still a human being who's trying to make some sense of it, you know, unless you're a, you know, renaissance capital where you can just put all your money into a black box that makes money all by itself and you don't really care how the money was made. You know, that's not most people. And, um, you know, so, so if you look at it and say, okay, how can we, how can, you know, how can we help people make sense of this whole thing? There's a ton to do, and that's, you know, that's what we've gotten into. We're pulling quotes, and we're trying to come up with alerts that make sense, and just try to figure out what's, what's significant, and, you know, and, and not overly try to do it the same way that we do for listed securities, but mm -hmm. do things differently that make sense. So. Yeah, Michael, I know you guys are waiting in the water, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing to try to shine some light on this asset class? So we're looking for sure, and we were, um, at the uh, CBO RMC, we had asked when options are coming. The, um, the answer was, we'll see, basically. But we're excited for options to come. In the meantime, we feel like we need to get involved, and we've been, we've been looking. Um, you know, we had found that there's, on the cryptocurrency side, there's issues surrounding just the maturity of the market overall. Can you get positions from a prime broker or a clearing firm or a custodian? Or, you mentioned all the exchanges, all the decentralization of the price feeds. Are you going to take them all in? Are you going to take some in? Are you going to go with an index? So those are the challenges where you feel like you're waiting to, you're either going to wait and see what settles out, or you're going to try to just go in there and do something yourself. On the crypto, on the alt tokens or alt coin space, that's totally different because now you've basically, I think the whole security token versus utility token thing is pretty much everything's a security token. So you're basically going to have companies listing pretty much stocks on these security exchanges. So when you have information like, what is the, you know, the source code repository for their smart contract? Like, that's the kind of information you're going to need to know, because if you're going to be trading this thing, you have to know what actually the contract is. Stuff like, is there going to be a security master? Is there going to be a description of what this company does? What is the relationship between this token and stocks that are out there? So I think that the, the opportunities, even without options, to dig into that space is, is tremendous. And we're, we're looking at it. I would encourage anybody who's interested to reach out, because this is something which is absolutely going to be customer driven, for sure. That's, uh, I was struck by what you were saying, Michael, in that 
it is very difficult to get like an aggregated start of day file from a clearing firm. And I was thinking like, wow, in the crypto space, like a start of day file is all data. I mean, truly, um, because you'll have an advantage if you actually get a start of day file that's aggregated with your positions for trading. So that tells me that we clearly are in the way in the first inning of, of this asset class. By the way, wallets, think about digital wallets and keys and you know cold storage and hot storage, all that stuff. That's all going to be super important, and that's stuff that you know was never dealt with in the option space, which will be fundamental. Robin, how are you thinking about this in terms of your data offering? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, addressed several mechanics uh, around cryptocurrencies, uh, but I think you mentioned the most important thing: there are absolutely no fundamentals around cryptocurrencies. So uh, we all know to a certain extent how the underlying of an option or a future can be evaluated with fundamentals. And we're keen to consume corresponding data sets in order to get a reliable forecast what might happen to the underlying with cryptocurrencies, regulation, completely uncertain. Um, no idea how valuable the asset is and will be. So uh, I think that's the biggest challenge. And that might also be the opportunity, of course. Right. Um, so if it's a risk and exposure, it's an opportunity as well. And uh, speaking of alternative data, I mean, people will, everyone in the industry will try to build their own model around valuating cryptocurrencies. And that it requires technology, data, et cetera, and a lot of modeling quant guys. Right. Barry, what are you going to do in this space? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Crypto earnings. I when don't are believe they? you. <laughs> Nothing. It's the quintessential alternative data. Yeah. But but we don't play it. We we provide data on 6,500 uh, public companies worldwide. But you got to be a company. Right. So we don't play in the space. Right. All right. I'd like to actually open it up to the audience at this <clears> time, <throat> and uh, there is a mic that can go around and uh, just take some questions for the panelists. Anything you guys want to ask? I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I use a lot of uh, alternative uh, data. It, basically, all my data is extrapolated. I trade a lot of flex options, OTC lookalikes, but my client base is institutional. So there's no database where it's in low latency. You can look up a strike and say, there it is. So how reliable is it? Like today, for example, I did a, a bunch of March 20 and March 21 of 2019 SPX trades. There's an AAM settlement around the 15th. I think there might be a quarterly on the 31st. So I can understand there's like a couple weeks there. So I can understand the, uh, I guess, uh, being naive, the ease of uh, figuring it out. But then I also did 18 months out in November, where there may be an expiration eight weeks prior, maybe three weeks after. How reliable is the extrapolation when you get out to these structures that don't have much data around them? Is it linear, or is it you have to figure out the curve? I mean, you're the experts. I actually. Use, Mike has a system that I use, and we also have a proprietary one that we built in-house, and they work, they, they work very well. I mean, when we compare my client's pricing to where it trades with the market makers, I see the values, and we're within you know, 20 cents of it. So this is good data, but I want to know, is there slippage? Um, how reliable is it? Right, so um, I'll send you the check later. Um, <laughs> Bill is referring to uh, Wingman, which is a free product that he uses to, to price structures. I would say that we do our best to, we really don't like to extrapolate beyond the <coughs> furthest listed date, because you don't know if it's going to go down or it's going to go up. But between dates, um, particularly in index, we'll use square of time. And there will definitely be curvature to it. We don't straight line. Um, I don't, you're doing mostly SPX, but in the names, you get issues where there might be the big trick that was going on for a while was people would quote things such that the, only the listed dates had earnings in them, and they would quote a date that didn't have earnings, and try to like trip up all the, you know, the banks with an OTC or, or a flex. So we deal with that. So we'll back events and earnings out of the entire curve, then we'll value things based on an event-free volatility surface. <coughs> For the stuff that you're looking at, I think if you're going far enough out there, I would just be really mindful of macro events, right? So people might choose two listed dates and try to catch you know, like a big macro event that you hadn't caught. Besides that, I would think that you'd be OK with the root time interpolation and always check your endpoints to make sure that there's nothing weird going on. Uh, yeah, I just had a question. Uh, like Robin and Michael touched on uh, 
every customer wants their own version of the API. And uh, Mike also said, well, before it was a SQL query that you wanted to run, but actually the SQL query gave you all the flexibility you wanted, whereas the API constrains you in, in a certain way, like you have a certain set of parameters and you get a certain data returned to. So if the API is where everything's headed and away from the SQL, how do you solve the challenge with the flexibility uh, for your customers? So, uh, yeah. go ahead. Sure. You yeah, okay. So, one of the biggest reasons that I think SQL Server or, or SQL had a hard time was because it wasn't really like a sort of edge technology where it was very public facing. You know, putting your SQL Server on the public internet is a very scary thing for a good reason. <coughs> Whereas having a web server which has got, you know, client facing endpoints is, you know, on the other side of the DMZ. It's just a thin layer that basically gets you over the, over the hop. Most of the customization has to happen in one of two places. One is that you need to develop a custom API on the back end and put all the business logic on the server side and then give your customer a very simple, you know, you make the function call, you pass your key in and a couple of parameters and you get your results back. The other is that you just need to provide a bunch of microservices that deliver all of the components that they need they need to pull them all in and then join them on their side, almost certainly using Python or R. I agree uh, and disagree to a certain extent. Uh, so our experience is the following. People are always uh, for, uh, looking for convenience and maximum quality. But that's, that's a conflict in itself. Uh, because if you want convenience, you're looking for normalization. If you're looking for flexibility, you have to deal with the underlying raw data sets. So uh, we ended up with um, offering all of it, all the flavors, and that was uh, something that Barry mentioned earlier. So um, it is, on the one hand, you cannot hide the most granular data sets from your clients, and you can deliver it through API as well, and then the client can run the SQL query on a local, uh, on a local ins instance. But uh, there is a significant value proposition to offer more convenient APIs that then be, can directly feed into machine learning, AI, TensorFlow, whatever quants are using or want to use these days. And we will see, and we already see, of course, more, and more people totally keen to find signals applying these new methodologies. The last thing they want to do is to deal with the underlying data sets. But it's very challenging to find a reliable interface where you can run these new methodologies more or less in a blind sort of way. So what happens is you have to offer a convenient access, but if a client wants to drill down or break down to the individual messages that were produced for the normalized success, you have to do that. You cannot just say, yeah, some black magic. Um, it, is, uh, it is a pretty challenging uh, discipline. Well, if you're delivering calculations, it's difficult, right? Because you don't want to send somebody a library. Right, and say, here's a library that does these calculations. Use C Sharp or C++ or Linux or Windows. So a lot of times we do, you do end up wanting to put the complexity on the server side. But Robin, I have a question about that. What if you have a data set that's got like hundreds of millions of rows, which I'm sure you do. Then obviously the customer can't pull that local. Or maybe they can, but yeah, exactly. I mean, you've got billions of rows. They're going to have to pull it local if they want to do an operation. So don't they kind of have to inject the calculations up into your system? Right. So, uh, yeah, injection is one thing, but handling large is, also, is, the, is the major thing. So SQL, and that was the previous question. Any database query language um, needs to be optimized to handle large data sets. If you just take the Opera feed or a single exchange, whatever, it's already billions of data records with, within a few days or months of data. So uh, it requires special technology, and I'm pretty sure that or some of you in the room are using technologies like OneTick or KDB and others. Um, so, and these technologies just exist because they manage large data set, but require a specific query methodology in order to, well, to allow you to implement use cases. So, um, I think it's a compromise. It's a, and uh, people start with raw data sets. They just want to pull the data, own it forever, and put it into their database system. But then they realize the limitations. They have to use special technologies, special operations people, optimize it, infrastructure, software layers, everything. 
And then they start thinking and say, well, maybe I don't need the tick data in an early R&D process. I can start with some daily aggregations. And then they come back and say, can you run the aggregations for me, please? Of course we can do that. Then it, it's executed on our back end, and they get just the results. And only for the opportunities they spot where they expect the signal, they dive deep into the tick by tick data. So it's always a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a flexibility that you need to offer in the channels, but that was mentioned earlier. So some people, uh, they just, or some users, they prefer time, um, file based deliveries. Some APIs, some database, query languages. Yeah, you have to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually have a, a separate question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the previous one. Uh, as far as we didn't really talk about the timing of the data uh, at all. So uh, there are multiple degrees of the timing. I mean, we all know like there's end of day, there is current day, and then within the current day, there's probably 20 degrees of the timeness of the data. Like there's, you know. Uh, every 15 minutes or whatever, or within a second, or a millisecond, or microsecond. So where is the money these days on the timing? Well, we deliver it all different types of ways, and where is the money? Uh, certainly, our more, we deliver our alt data. Some of it gets delivered once a day, some of it gets delivered nine times a day, some of it gets delivered every five minutes, and some of it gets delivered in milliseconds. Um, I will tell you that we get the most money from the millisecond feeds, because those are the higher priced. I can tell you that in terms of understanding what our clients are doing with that data, we hear almost nothing from the millisecond data, and we hear a lot from the slower data. So my guess is that, if I had to guess, I would say that the money is to be made in terms of the profitability off of that data in the millisecond way. So to follow up on that, this goes back to something that had come up earlier, which is how you have to evolve, right? So it used to be that we would be looking at the vol change on the day, or the stock price change on the day, right? And then people started to realize that, hey, you know what? Everything happens overnight. You come in, markets up or down in a particular name, and then they care about the change since the opening. The change since the open is how we were calling it. Right at, these days, what people are looking for is custom time windows. That's what people want. They want to say that I would like to specify that for a particular metric, I want to see the change in the last 10 minutes. And for another metric, the change in the last minute or the last 20 minutes. And they're looking for that flexibility. And then when they're looking at names, they would look at certain names, like a lot of the FANG stocks, like basically like an index. And they would look at other names that were less liquid you know, with different time windows. And so they want that per, per underlier type of custom time window. And then alerts on the back of that. Well, and I would say that, that you know, if you get into that microsecond arms race, it's Citadel and Susquehanna and everybody else is, is one rung below. And you know, where the money is, is very few people are willing to sit, sit on Susquehanna willing to go up against each other. But nobody else is. That's a race that most people are like, good luck to you. So um, you know, I think people applying their own, you know, their own approach are tr really trying to stay the heck away from that because it's so expensive. And there's really only going to be one winner. Um, you know, so we see, you know, we see people with, you know, even even big banks that are like, you know, what we're not trying to do a, you know, a five millisecond micro forecast. We're, we're just that's not our game. Um, we care much more at kind of trying to step back a little bit and, you know, see some value that way. Time of the day is also, sorry, time of day is important as well. We did a study a while back. We probably should do it again, where we looked at the total amount of Vega that traded throughout the course of the day. It was like 35 or 40% traded basically at the open. And then the rest mostly traded towards the end of the day. And it was kind of like a big U shape. So if you see unusual activity and unusual volume during the day, that's a big deal. Because that means something's going on. And that's where you want to focus your efforts. If things are busy at the open, it's sort of just settling out like what needs to happen. But if things are going on during the day, that's a much bigger deal. If you see a big vol change during the day or a big volume, that's, I would weight that indicator a lot higher. Let me make just one, one comment, because um, when you were talking about uh, Susquehanna and Citadel and such, 
we sell all the way to millisecond, we ask our clients all the time, do we need to go faster? And the interesting answer is no. That you got the big boys all slugging each out, and so what they're interested from us in that millisecond range is you just have to be faster than some schlub in front of a Bloomberg. And so, you know, there, there's kind of the automated trading versus, um, versus the other stuff. I think I have to challenge that, and our experience is slightly different. Uh, uh, it is uh, today, I would claim that it's not a question of cost, whether you are analyzing historical data in nanosecond precision or in millisecond precision. And it definitely matters for market makers. So we are working uh, with the largest market makers in futures globally. And uh, they all cannot do with milliseconds. Even though they might not be in the ultra low latency space, they are latency sensitive. It, it definitely matters whether they are a few microseconds earlier or later, because they have to understand the sequence of events and, uh, well, forecast their own fair value uh, in their model. So, um, it's absolutely impossible to rely on a millisecond. And it's not a question of cost anymore. Technology is a huge enabler here. It was, 10 years ago, it was a big difference. It was a big, it, has, it had a big impact on the TCO of solutions that are capable of managing nanosecond precision, but these days, absolutely not. We have uh, time for one last question if somebody wants to ask one. Right up in front there. Um, I'm not sure of the uh, composition of the audience in the room here, but on behalf of uh, small trading shops, small prop shops, individual traders like myself, despite Henry saying that we're all we're kind of disappearing, um, you know, we, what alter you have all these alternative data sets. Alternatively, what hasn't changed on our side is two things, limited desktop real estate and limited brain capacity. So you're a silo, you're a silo, you're a silo, and you're a silo. Is there anybody out there, or have you guys ever thought about offering some type of suite where it integrates some of the various things you're doing to make it more functional for us? Because right now, I, you know, as part of a small trading group, I, we couldn't possibly take in or utilize all these different things and make sense out of them. So I am just want to see if there's any you know, what, what is the future of, of all these silos that you guys are operating? So I would say that people need to focus on what they're really good at, which is like why, you know, imitation is a great form of flattery, but true partnership is really how you're successful. I feel like in this space, particularly for small vendors, we have customer relationships. I mean, I'm not, Henry is taking some of our analytics through REST API, and, um, you know, we use, uh, some data from Wall Street Horizons, you know, and so when you're using one of our products, you actually are getting some of those ingredients, depending on how you, you would like to, to look at it. So there's a lot more cooperation and, you know, sometimes cooperation than you might think, but um, we're all open to partnership. So if you need to get additional content through Henry that, you know, he doesn't have, then we'll just work it out. At the end of the day, we're about solving your problem. And if your problem is you need to have it in one place, you go to Henry and say, we need to have X, Y, Z, and can you get it delivered through Trade Alert? And Henry's job is to figure out how to make that happen. Likewise, we do that with us, FT, that's, whether that's the business we're in, is solving your problem. And if, if that's it. I think it is a problem. You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, we've, we've always, when we go in and show our stuff off, if it's an option <laughs> shop, they always like what we have because the information we have is pretty useful information. But there is that hurdle like, you know what, I'm looking at eight things already, and my brain capacity is like, I can't stretch it to the ninth thing. And, you know, what you're saying is very interesting. And they're really like, you know, us adding FT values to real time trades you know, was something that, that you know, it, it occurred kind of organically because we we're like, oh, this, your stuff's good, our stuff's good, it all makes sense. And I think that, um, I think technology could also kind of, you know, like th there's so much flexibility, you know, feasible now in, in different tools that, you know, you could, you could end up with a platform that does let you kind of, you know, really through the RESTful APIs, 
pull in, and the question is how complicated is it to make it do what you want it to do? But um, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Look, working you know, seven or eight or nine different systems to, to see little different things is, is, isn't like I mean, I mean, you're, sustainable. You're sort of getting there. I mean, I'm a client of yours, and, you have take, and I use some of your stuff that goes through your thing, but I don't have any access to what you have. Yes, you do. Well, I, I don't, you know, because it, it goes, you can see through the stuff. Where to find it. Yeah. Right. Okay. But if it all integrated into my trading system mm -hmm. so that I can go from trade alert and, you know, hit the button and it loads into my trading system, you know, that type of stuff would be really, really we're, helpful. We'll talk about that because, like, when we were doing IM stuff, we had clients ask us if we could integrate our theoreticals and, and our analytics into IM. And Henry was the first call I made. And he's like, you know, because we don't want to go out there and say, okay, well, we need an IM strategy, right? So we spoke to Henry, and he's like, all right, so this is really cool. If you're going to go integrate with, big, you know, big vendor A, then um, we'd like to look at that as well. And that all came from a customer request. A customer needed our analytics in their IM. And at that moment, they only cared about themselves. But then when we started to engage with other partners, we realized that that's something that people might care about. So it's going to come from you guys. Yeah, just keep asking for new stuff. It makes our job easier anyway. So. Great. It's true. Well, we're going we're gonna to conclude at this time so everybody can go get a drink and snacks. Please uh, join me in a round of applause for Michael and Henry and Robin and Barry. Thank you, guys. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options. Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.